So ready to just uh, launch into the meeting at this point, yes? Yes, sure. Good, okay, thank you. Um, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the Liverpool City Region Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I'd like to welcome all those present. The meeting is will be broadcast live to the combined authority website and available for subsequent viewing. Can members and officers please ensure that when you wish to speak, you indicate in the chat box, which I'll be keeping an eye on. When you're invited to speak, please unmute your microphone, switch on your camera. Don't forget to turn your mic and camera off, off afterwards. Finally, can everyone ensure their phones are switched to silent? So just check in if most people got their um, microphones on mute. It does improve the sound quality for everybody. So thanks for that. Next item is membership of the committee. Colleagues, can I bring to your attention some information about the membership of the committee? We've been notified by Sefton Council that Sam Marshall has resigned as an elected member I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sam Marshall for her contribution to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and in particular her enthusiasm and active participation in the work of the task and finish groups. If colleagues agree, I'll send a letter of thanks to her on your behalf and pass on our best wishes. I hope everybody's OK with that. We've also been made aware that there is now a vacancy on the committee for a Labour representative from Liverpool City Council. The Combined Authority Democratic Services team are awaiting notification of nominations in order that formal appointments can be made to the vacancies at the next available meeting of the Combined Authority. Next up, apologies. Are there any apologies for absence? Yes, Chair. I've received apologies from Councillor John Morgan. We Thank also you. know that Councillor Kevin Wainwright is having trouble accessing the meeting, so unfortunately it doesn't look like he's been able to join. Um, we know that Holt and Council are trying to help him access the meeting, so possibly he may join at a later stage this morning. We are core at though at this point. That's great. Thank you very much for that update. Okay. Next item is declarations of interest. Have any declarations of interest been received? None received, Chair. Thank you, Lisa. If there are no declarations of interest, can we move on to the next item of the agenda, which is the minutes of the previous meeting of the LCR Overview and Scrutiny Committee that was held on the 22nd of July 2020. The minutes of the meeting of the LCR Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 22nd of July 2020 are included at pages 1 to 10. Colleagues, an amendment has been put forward to change the LCR opposition group Liberal De Democrat member to Councillor Andy Corkle Hill and list Councillor Dr John Pugh in the list of members present from Sefton Council. Is that agreed? Thank you. Are those minutes now agreed and accepted as an accurate record of the meeting? Agreed. OK, thanks. Because everybody's on mute, it's probably easiest. Um, I have an indication from Sir Ron Watson and Councillor Dr John Pugh. So Sir Ron Watson first, please. Uh, yes, Chairman, thank you very much. It's, it's actually on this issue of apologies for absence. Um, this refers to the fact that one member uh, had not been able to access the meeting uh, for whatever technical reasons apply and you shared with us this morning that we have another member who is actually in the same position uh, and it, it, it seems to me it's rather unfair uh, to have these people down as having given an apology when they're self-evidently trying very hard to get the meeting and it's more than likely that the reason they're not able to join is not lack of effort to attend or interest. It's a technical problem over which they probably got little or no control. So I, I would simply ask uh, for perhaps the legal representative 
to have a form of wording that more adequately reflects that. Um, what's shown in four is self-evidently exactly what happened, uh, but then it was added to the list of apologies. Well, the, the, I'm not being semantic, but the person didn't apologise. The person wanted to be here and wasn't able to for reasons over which uh, presumably they had little or no control, but they self-evidently, as has our colleague this morning, gone to great effort uh, to try and attend and I think there should be some mechanism by which that can be reflected in the minutes. So if that could be taken on board, I'd be most grateful. I think that's a fairly reasonable point. And I also know that Councillor Wainwright has been trying for some time to get on. So you're absolutely right. It's not a lack of effort. Um, would any of the officers want to comment on, on what's been suggested there? Thank you, Councillor Crow. Um, the regulations um, that were passed by the government as a result of the COVID emergency say that councillors must be heard and be able to be seen to be considered as being present at a meeting. So any form of words we put will confirm that they weren't participating in part of the meeting, but we can reflect that they were having technical difficulties, but they will still not be counted as having attended the meeting. Does that satisfy Councillor Watson? Well, I'd, I'd imagine not probably, but what, what if he was able to get in at some point in the meeting, would he then be considered to be in attendance? Yes. Councillor Watson, Watson uh, Sylvan Watson, uh, did you want to come back on that? Um, I'm quite satisfied with that, um, Chairman. It's, it's simply what we have now is what you might call the traditional way in which we deal with things. We're not in traditional times. Um, and, and I think that, uh, and I absolutely take the point, if a member is not able to be heard, I'm not that bothered about seeing people. I know what most of them look like. And apart from the fact that you started to have beards, nothing much is altered. Uh, but I think if it could be reflected in some wording, it's just been indicated, I'd be happy with that. I, I just don't want people uh, to uh, be perceived as having given an apology, when actually they haven't. They've tried very <clears> hard. <throat> and if a form of words could indicate that, and I think it's possible from what we've heard, I I'd be more than satisfied with that. All right, thank you for that point. Um, so, uh, Councillor Dr John Pugh had requested to speak, and just um, for the record, um, Councillor O'Brien also wants to speak, I believe. Uh, the chat box is the right way to do this, Councillor O'Brien. So. Uh, you're now on the list to speak, uh, but first, Councillor Dr John Pugh. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chair. Uh, is, is it oh, on to matters arising? Because that's what mine is, really, rather than directly a uh, critique of the content of the minutes. I, 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 think, that's, I think that's reasonable. Oh, yeah, matters yeah. arising. In which case, um, I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, you, members will be aware that the last meeting we was entered with the recovery plan and I asked for a breakdown of all the schemes, some kind of chart showing uh, in, a, in some sort of list uh, how uh, funding was uh, bid for and also whether there were any sort of um, associated financial support from the private sector and the like. Um, and it was agreed that that list be provided. I think the mayor readily agreed, and Mark Bowsted, who was sitting next to him, said that it was already available. Um, it didn't arrive in my written box anyway, and I chased it up with Trudy on the 27th of July. She said he would chase it up. I've not seen it in my inbox. And I apologise to Trudy if I missed it. Um, but it's quite critical that we understand, I think, not just what we're bidding for, but also what other sources of finance are available for the recovery plan, which are not directly coming from the government. Um, and I was put on record my um, disappointment that um, that request made openly at the meeting hasn't so far uh, been fulfilled. I know there is a list uh, today uh, on the MERS report of the various asks of the government, a kind of extended wish list of things we want finance for. But it seems to admit um, some of the elements of the original very long document we had, which included references to sources of private capital. For example, if we take um, the bid we were putting in for money for the Southport Pleasure Land, there was some suggestion there that uh, private funds would be available to support the development and to complement it. Now, that's not in, uh, as far as I can see today, the report of um, 
the, the list of things that we're asking the government for. So we've not got, I think, what should be a, a definitive list of, uh, in the recovery plan, uh, what we're asking the government for, how much, and whether or not any of these schemes are associated with um, private capital or capital from other public sources. Um, and we're going to scrutinise that kind of programme. It's a very big programme, or, or may well be a very big programme. We need to have that sort of data. And I, I just want to put on record, Chair, my, my genuine disappointment that having asked at a public meeting like this for the information, having been told by the mayor that I would get the information, having been assured by the officer that the information was readily available, it's still not here. Councillor Crown, I can respond to Councillor Pugh's um, initial question. Um, Councillor Pugh, that's my, my fault. I do apologise. I've been on leave and that information has come in um, with regards to the request that you made at the meeting. So I will get that sent to yourself and the rest of the committee members after this meeting. Again, that's my error and I do apologise for that. OK. Uh, okay. Thank Trudy for that and uh, I, I look forward to receiving information. OK. OK, uh, thanks, Trudy. Um, Councillor O'Brien had indicated you'd like to speak. Can you hear me? We sure can. Yeah, good. Um, first of all, I would like to praise, uh, I think it probably is Trudy, because I thought the minutes were excellent, very full. Um, but over this question about apologies, I'd like to say that the councillor that I was discussing did actually attend the meeting in the end, so I hope he's not down as apologies. He may have come in late, but he was successful in getting in. So I hope he won't be recorded as apologies. I do understand Jill's point that unless you're contributing, you can't really be registered as there. But I wonder if there's some other way of expressing that, you know, an extra form of apology due to technical difficulties. I'd be happy with that. I am not happy just with apologies for accents when people have, have tried. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien. I think your comment is noted or would you like a comment from the from the officers regarding that? Well, as long as it's noted, I'm happy. Thank you. Think it, about it. Indeed, absolutely. Um, in that case, are the minutes now agreed and accepted as an accurate record of those meetings? those meetings. Agreed. Thank you people. Agreed. Great okay so moving on to the next item which is the appointment of a substitute member to the Audit and Governance Committee for 2020-2021. Can I have a nomination for a substitute member from the Conservative group to sit on the Audit and Governance Committee for 2020-21 please? Yes, Chair. I'm happy to nominate Sir Ron Watson. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Is that uh, seconded? I'm, I'm happy to uh, act in that capacity, Chairman, so if it would help, I'll, I'll second myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is that then agreed, colleagues? Agreed. Yeah, I mean, generally Agreed. agreed. Oh, fantastic. OK. Agreed. Thank you. In that case, that is agreed. Thanks very much. Um, the next item is Metro Mayor Steve Rotherham's update. Can I invite the Metro Mayor Steve Rotherham to take us through his update on his recent activities, please? Hopefully um, the committee will be able to see me, Chair. I'm in front of a, a newly set up laptop. Um, <coughs> so if it works, brilliant. If not, please, uh, somebody let me know. Um, just in regard Steve, Steve, just at the moment we can't see you. So if if you hover your mouse over the screen, do you get a little bar about a third of the way up? No, it's the thing I've checked the um it, it says the camera is on at the moment. Um so I, I don't understand why that I'll switch it off and then back on again, see if it, it does work. It's back on again. No. Try one more click. Um, I suspect that uh, someone will have to cede control, uh, Steve, so uh, I don't know whether 
uh, Lisa or someone can actually uh, l- relinquish control of this uh, this broadcast because essentially what we're seeing is whoever's got control at the moment. So you need to seize control in more than one sense of the uh, uh, political uh, uh, and psychological uh, uh, future for the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, whilst somebody's trying to see whether technically I, I, I can be seen, um, hopefully I can still be heard, uh, and that that will have to do at the moment because we, um, I've got other. There's a, something come up on my screen, and it's in too short a, a, um, a font for me to. I'm going to have to leave it. Um, I, I've got something else that I have to leave at five to eleven, so um, I, I'll try and plough through this as quickly as possible, Chair, so that we can answer some questions. But um, I, I thought it was important, even if it's an abridged appearance, to still ensure that I keep up my record of attending all the overview and scrutiny committees because I believe, as I've said previously, this is so important to what we do as a combined authority. And kind of start off by associating myself with uh, your words, Chair, around Councillor Marshall's resignation and I wish her well um, and um, uh, hopefully she'll go on to uh, great things. Never, You never know, might return to politics in the future. Um, okay, so People will know that back in July, we published Building Back Better, which was referred to by Councillor Pugh, which sets out the blueprint for our economic recovery. And the plan is made up of many projects that represent the transformational opportunities for places, for communities, and for sectors across the city region. And throughout the crisis, I've been clear that there should be no return to business as usual um, we have to build back better. And for me, that means fixing some of the underlying issues with our economy and society that needed addressing even before the pandemic. Um, so low pay, for instance, insecure work, underfunded public services, the fact that our councils are being hollowed out. Um, we need to build on the positive responses that we've experienced also during the lockdown period. So for, in, in, for instance, government, um, playing a more active role in the nation's economy, uh, respecting the contributions of key workers, for instance, more flexible working, um, you know, in regard to the patterns of working, but recognising the importance of work-life balance much better. The cleaner air that we had for three months uh, and the fact that more people were being active, um, that should be something that we take forward. So the recovery plan takes all of this on board and sets out how we can reshape our local economy in a greener, fairer and more inclusive way. And just to let the committee know that this isn't a dusted down, sort of off the shelf, um, tried and failed rehash of previous policies. It's a, a unique plan for our local economy, um, for our specialisms, the thing that we are famous for and for the opportunities that we have in a post-COVID world. And it rests upon a number of key themes. So they are the business ecosystem, people-focused recovery, um, place-based recovery, and our green opportunities for recovery. And you'll see from the report that we've asked the government for an investment, an investment of 1.4 billion pounds which will unlock about £8.8 .8 billion pounds worth of projects that could begin in the next 12 months in the city region. So whilst they are strategic and transformational, they're not pie in the sky. These things can actually happen and we have business plans uh, for each of these projects. And they'll create about 94,000 jobs, permanent jobs, um, with a further 28,000 in the construction phase. And that will mean that we can secure employment for people who currently are not in work, um, about 26,000, and generate more than £8.5 billion pounds of GVA in the city region economy. So really important and huge uh, opportunities for the government to work with us, but it's not a handout, it is an investment opportunity. And we're already seeing the aspects um, of the economic recovery plan that we put forward coming to fruition with some of the schemes getting government back in. So we've received some government funding so far for 
a variety of projects that have kickstarted the local economies. Um, I'll give you a few examples. For instance, at the end of, the ju of June, um, MHCLG confirmed £45 million to bring forward brownfield sites that will have a majority element of housing. So turning brownfield into housing, which um, I know um, from a political perspective is hugely supported right away across the, the spectrum. The target housing number supported will be at least 3,000. We're hoping it will be more than that. We've got ambitions for it to be about 4,000, but that will help us address the housing crisis. And certainly a lot of those will be affordable homes. Um, and of course, this protects the green space and, and takes the pressures of having to develop on green field and green space. We've also agreed with government um, for four shovel ready projects, totaling about £26 million, and we've got the sign off for those already. Um, they are £11 million for the development of Littlewood, um, the one on Edge Lane that you all go past probably, uh, to build that into a film studio um, and create tech and education space. Um, but that, that's something that's received huge national and international recognition. We've secured £9 million for the development of Glass Futures. Again, um, something that could be transformational. It's about trialling um, hydrogen in energy intensive industries. And if it works, then of course it can be replicated um, in other industries across the country. We've got £2 million for the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine capacity development um, of space um, at their centre in Liverpool. £4 million for the remediation and development of Halls Need South, which is, as you know, a logistics site in, in Nosley. So four big schemes, but lots and lots of others. And these will create already thousands of jobs and play a, a key role in the first stages of that economic recovery that we've spoken about. And all of this is quite simply happening because of devolution. Without devolution uh, and a credible recovery plan, that funding would not have been available to our city region. Now, whilst that 20 odd million pounds is very much welcome, I've been clear with government that it's only the tip of the iceberg, really, in regard to the support we need. Um, devolution for me should be about the decentralisation of things. In other words, Westminster doesn't know best and it should be about taking powers and money away from the centre and giving it to local people who can shape our recovery better than Whitehall Mandarins could ever wish to do. And in return um, for this, the government gets a bigger bang for, ex for its book. We've demonstrated the additionality in regard to returns to government from the investment that's already come to us because we can do things better, leaner, more nimbly, cleaner um, and much more quickly um, than a national government could hope to do. And so at an even further strategic level, back in August, I launched um, a campaign alongside um, Andy Burnham and Francis O'Grady from the TUC uh, to support workers and we asked um, for funding for those people who'd been asked or told to self-isolate after coming into contact with somebody with COVID. Um, and we need that support more than ever. People on low incomes, some people on zero hours contracts, many people who are self-employed, who do come into contact with people that's all to self-isolate for 14 days who have no income. Uh, and we think that might well be having an impact on areas where we're seeing sharp rises in global transmission. Um, in regard to um, the spread of coronavirus, um, we need to ensure that we do everything locally that we can, um, whilst it looks um, likely that governments will continue to take action on local lockdowns. So we want to support families in the Liverpool City region and obviously our economy by trying to stave off any possibility that there will be local lockdowns here. But our infection rates 
are climbing and becoming more and more worrying by the day. And I'm getting daily updates on those figures. Um, in the Liverpool City region, there are at least 47,000 workers who are ineligible even for statutory sick pay because their incomes are too low. And there are 84,000 people who are self-employed and all of those people will be left with no income if they're asked to self-isolate. Now, over the past few weeks, the government has announced plans to introduce a trial scheme uh, to pay low-paid workers in England up to £13 a day to self-isolate um, after coming into co contact with someone with COVID. But it's way below where we think many workers um, deserve. And of course, what we're trying to demonstrate is that by people carrying out their civic duty, this can save the public purse because um, COVID, uh, people who, who are infected with COVID cost the public purse an awful lot more. So if we can reduce that number, actually there's a saving um, to Treasury, but of course the health implications are much uh, more important. And what I'd say is uh, I think we should be treating this almost like jury service where you carry out your civic duty and you are compensated for doing that. Um, people will know that in regard to um, our response to COVID, uh, I launched something called LCR Cares in partnership with the Community Foundation for Merseyside. Um, and that supports voluntary and community sector organisations across the six districts um, and the people that they serve. And the funding is focused on five key areas, so emergency food provision, delivery of services and projects supported, um, supporting the most vulnerable, uh, emotional and mental health well, well-being, financial inclusion and support of access benefits and debt advice. Um, also, you know, food, care and activity packages have been delivered right the way across the six districts to the most vulnerable and that's because we were able to use this uh, new charity to get money from the uh, National Emergencies Trust and um, in total we have got about 1.6 million pounds of which most of it, I think more than 1.5 million, has already been distributed because we wanted money in and money out to go and do some good work across the, uh, the whole city region. So with that, Chair, I'll, I'll leave it because I know time's short. We'll see if we can take some questions, but I've got about 15 minutes, if that's OK. Thanks very much, Steve. I have uh, indication to speak from Councillor Howard first and Councillor Dr John Pugh afterwards. So, Councillor Howard. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks for the update, Steve. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the um, Brownfield Land Fund. So in the report it talks about an additional 40 million to be allocated on a competitive basis to the most um, ambitious authorities. I just wanted to ask um, what the definition of ambitious was in that context and also if that 40 million is to be allocated from central government or whether that's already with the city region to then be allocated on from there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to, to answer that, Councillor Howard. Um, so we've got £45 million already. That's sort of in the bank. Uh, it never really is, is until you've spent it. But we're, we've got four, up to £45 million. But then there's a competitive round where if we have ambitious projects, we can bid into. So we are looking to use the £45 million, which includes ambitious projects, but if we were to um, put some of those into the competitive round and we're successful, we would then free up the equivalent amount it, from the money that we've already secured so we can use it for other projects. So we will be going for uh, the competitive round. Um, hopefully we'll secure some of that as well and that £45 million pounds will increase. But of course we need a pipeline of of good projects and that seems to be a stumbling point in many instances. Lots of our local authorities are being hollowed out as I said earlier um, and many organisations just don't have the capacity to develop projects to the stage where they can demonstrate the value that's needed. 
um, for, for government funding to be released. So we're looking at capacity issues and how we can use some combined authority monies to um, use it as revenue funding for capacity building. OK, thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, Councillor Pugh. I've got, I've got two unrelated points. I, uh, thanks for the report, Steve. Can I start off by being typically tedious and, and boring? Um, on item uh, page 14 of the report you present, I'll, I'll use this as an illustration. Um, there's a the kind of thing that sort of gives me concern about the way data is being presented to us. Um, it says, I think the combined authority is seeking £335 million pounds of devolved funding to unlock £3 billion pounds of projects. And as you read through the list, um, there's a range of things listed there, and we may be asking the government for the entire sum or a lesser sum or whatever. But you get to things like the new stadium for Everton Football Club, 500 million, which is obviously more than 335 million we're asking for the government. But what I think we'd really like to know is how much we're asking the government to support the new stadium for Everton Football Club. If we have a figure, uh, what that figure might look like. Um, because I think in terms of the ask we're making of government, we, we need to understand it in order to scrutinise it. And having a, a, a total of 355 million and a series of bullet points to total far more than that doesn't altogether help. So can I just, just generally make a plea for a little more detail and transparency, particularly as the list presented today differs in some ways uh, from the list that was presented at the previous meeting of the ask of government for example i think the southport projects which did involve elements of match funding are not there and um, my second point is a much more um sort of constructive one if i can put it like that that wasn't meant to be unconstructive um and that's with regard to the households into work program which i think is one of the best things the uh, local city region run um, which it looked as though it was going to have a fairly positive outcome because we were looking at, at when it was originally started at a fairly stable labour market. Well, that's not what we've got now. And I understand that during the process of COVID lockdown, contact with the families that we're trying to support um, has been attenuated rather less than we would wish. I wonder whether it'd be helpful, I say this to the chair as much as to Steve, if, if we could have a report on this to find out what we think now can be achieved through this project and what difficulties they are experienced because obviously if this project households into work succeeds uh, and can be rolled out further it could make a substantial change to many many people's lives we'd like it to succeed but the circumstances at the moment are currently against it against it and i wonder whether it would be helpful to have the people running that project um, to share their grief or their problems or their progress uh, with us at a future meeting because I don't think we can just assume that this will just fade away or be because it will not have anything other than major importance. So two points basically, can we have a little more transparency and clarity rather than have flurry of figures thrown at us? And two, can we have a report on the households into work um, project because I'm sure everybody on the committee would wish that to succeed. OK, Councillor Pugh, on, on the, the first one, um, the answer is no, probably, because, and I don't mean that flippantly, it depends on how you cut something up and present it. So the figures always change dependent on what the audience is. So what we've done previously is provided you with stuff that we've sent to national governments, and that will include certain things where they might be stripped out down to a, 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 um, a more local level for the consumption of a local audience. For instance, um, you mentioned Everton Football Club and there's a £335 million ask. Um, part of that is for our contribution towards, um, potential contribution towards Everton Football Club. And the reason that there's no figure probably is because some of these negotiations are commercial in confidence and it won't be until obviously there is an agreement and that isn't currently um, for them to go through the combined authority. But I'm happy for information to be shared with individual members as long as the individual members abide by the commercial confidentiality of 
um, the uh, reports that are presented. So there's some stuff that we're happy for it to go out. Um, there's some stuff that we have to keep commercially sensitive uh, and that, that's possibly where the, um, the sort of ambiguities creep in. If um, any members though want clarification on any of the figures that are presented, please just ask and we will get you them. I, I apologise and Trudy has because Trudy's normally spot on. Um, she's apologised um, for the omittance of, of sending out the information as requested. Um, I, I want you to see as much as it's possible for you to see without jeopardising, of course, some of the major things that we want to take forward. And, and that means that sometimes there will be things that are commercial in confidence. In regard to household into work, I'm glad that it's being identified that this is uh, an exemplar, not just by people locally, but by national government. And what happened was we have a, uh, a process by which we don't look at sanctions first. And of course, during COVID, one of the things I've thought about Build Back Better is that the government suspended uh, the sanctions first approach. And, and unfortunately, that suspension at some stage um, will be curtailed, but it's been successful even at a national level. And I'd like to think that's because they saw that you don't need to beat people up who are at the bottom end of the socio-economic ladder um, to make them do certain things. It's about talking to them, encouraging them. Um, it's about recognising the wraparound support that's needed on many occasions. It's about ensuring that those individuals are best placed to understand what they need to do so that they can move through um, the processes into a career. And so that, that's really good. And we're looking to extend the household into work uh, project, um, which is quite a risky thing because we haven't secured national funding as yet, but we believe that it's such an important project for the city region that that's what we should do. So we're looking at the potential of um, some sort of bridge um, funding so that we can keep it going. Otherwise, we might well have to lose staff, which is not something that any of us want to do. And, and so we um, we will be putting something to the combined authority, I think, in the, in the forthcoming meeting. But if not, the one after that, but probably um, Jill will be able to tell us when that report is coming forward. Thank, thank you for that, Steve. And uh, in response to your second question, Councillor Pugh, I think we could request officers to have a sort of report or update about that programme uh, at a future meeting. Do you think that would be OK, Trudy or Jill? Hi, Councillor Crone. Yes, I can. I've made a note to um, raise that as part of the work planning item. So that's something that can certainly be added in for a future um, agenda. So yeah, I'll pick that up as part of that item. Thanks very much for that. Thanks. I have a, okay, thanks. I've got a um, indication from Sir Ron Watson that he'd like to speak. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Steve, I'm very conscious of the fact that you need to leave, um, but I wonder if I could ask for your advice on one point. Um, most of the schemes which you've got here uh, self-evidently are capital intensive uh, and have been described as shovel ready. Uh, however, we all know that the difficulty on so many occasions isn't actually the capital, it's the subsequent revenue and a lot of these schemes you would look at and hope that at the very least they would be in a break-even type situation if not have some element of profit in them but there are also a range of others where self-evidently that will not be the case and they will require ongoing revenue support and it's not clear to me from the report who will be responsible for that ongoing revenue support and indeed how subsequently it will be funded. If it's going to fall uh, to any large extent on local authorities individually, 
within Merseyside, then that's going to be a major problem for an awful lot of them. Uh, and they will then have to make a very difficult decision about whether or not they're prepared to go ahead knowing uh, that the impact on the potential council tax uh, levy will will be that much higher um, or, or whether or not you have had any form of discussion which indicates how the ongoing costs can actually be funded. Uh, I could give you a number of examples in my own area where uh, there are schemes that are shovel ready but where they have got a very severe potentially uh, based on past experience uh, revenue implications so the council will be have to be very careful indeed as to whether or not they're prepared to take on that level of burden the reports don't actually indicate that um, and it would be very helpful if the schemes could be divided up into the two categories or, or potentially three one is one off capital one is capital with revenue uh, and then the third element of that is where does the revenue the ongoing revenue actually come from because i think it would be much easier to make decisions if that sort of split was made um thanks councillor watson and i think you've hit on a, a very salient point at the moment which is around um capital and revenue capital we it's a one-off payment. We, we give it to somebody, somebody builds something. You're right, the revenue costs associated with many of those projects are probably more intangible now than at any stage um, in our recent history because of coronavirus. So if I give you a couple of examples, um, we've got Shakespeare North, of course, fantastic project. The catalyst for huge revitalization of what's happening in Prescott and in the uh, Nosley area. But of course, if um, and when it opens, if people are still socially distancing and we don't know when the end of COVID will come, um, that means that revenues will be reduced and there will be um, the need for some sort of, of funding to ensure um, the, the future of that type of a project. The same with Eureka over on the Wirral, um, fantastic project. But again, if we have reduced capacity um, of visitors that will hit revenue streams, but they are the, you know, the responsibility of those individual organisations that bid in. So Nosley Council um, for Shakespeare, for instance, and Eureka themselves and, and their company uh, for that. The, the more problematic area, I think, um, is anything around public transport. Uh, and at the moment, we're running nearly 100% of bus numbers, but with a 20, 20 odd percent capacity of passengers. In other words, our ability to get fare box revenue returns is at, at about a fifth of where we normally would be at an equivalent point in previous years. Uh, and, and that's the big one for me. We are gonna have to take some very, very difficult decisions around public transport because revenues are, are literally hemorrhaging um, and might be for two years, three, I don't know when it will return to normal. But you, you're right, we, we do have to look at that. And in answer to the, the question, I'm fairly certain that we can break it up and um, compartmentalise capital only, capital and rev, and then any um, ongoing support but the ongoing support wouldn't come from our funding streams. Thank you, Steve. Um, you. With that, unfortunately, I, I really am going to have to leave because it's uh, about trying to get more money for the combined authority. So hopefully you'll understand that. OK, well, thanks very much for your update, Steve, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, so uh, apologies to people who'd indicated they wanted to speak and weren't able to. Um, it appears the mayor's didn't have enough time for the committee today, unfortunately, but hopefully you have a chance to ask him the questions you want to at a future date. So moving on now to item five, which is the Liverpool City Region Climate Progress Update. This report seeks to update members on progress to address the climate emergency declared by the LCR Combined Authority in 2018. 
Can I invite Rachel Waggett, Principal, Principal Environment Officer, to take us through the presentation, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Can everybody hear me? Is everybody, can you hear me, Chair? I can hear you fine, Rachel, yeah. Excellent. I just wanted to check. I have prepared some slides this morning um, on the basis that I know some people are uh, participating in the meeting on tablets and it makes it very difficult to see documents at the same time. So this is just a few slides to highlight some of the issues that are raised in this report. If you move on to the next slide please Trudy, thank you. The purpose of this report that you have seen is to update you on the progress that we've made against the climate emergency declaration that was made in 2019. Now you might remember that 2019 was the year of the environment in Liverpool City region. It was an immensely successful year and the culmination of that year was the Environment Summit which was held in November 2019. At that summit a huge number of environmental organisations came together to celebrate the success of the year and also to set a precedent going forward for more action. The Metro Mayor Steve Rotherham at the time of the summit announced that he was intending to set up a new city region climate partnership and the idea of that climate partnership was to shape and direct the work of the combined authority. He also announced the creation of a 500,000 pound community environment fund which was to focus on participation, engagement and catalyzing this community action. So the purpose of this report today is to seek your views on the proposed key principles that we have for our action plan for climate to present to you the three proposed eligibility streams for that fund that was announced last year and also to ask your views on how you wish to engage with the community and climate action plan going forward. Next slide please. Just to give you some background on the climate partnership despite the pandemic lockdown we have started the partnership and we have been meeting monthly since May. The partnership is chaired by Gideon Bentovim, who you will know is the Mayor's Ambassador for Environment and the Deputy Chair is Councillor Jill Ward who I'm sure many of you know is the Deputy Portfolio Holder for Low Carbon and Renewables. But the membership of the organisation is incredibly wide so we have local authority portfolio holders but also our university and academic sector, environmental organisations, statutory bodies, the third sector. Importantly, we also have campaigning groups such as Extinction Rebellion, Faith Community, and we have a number of young people who were engaged in that forum as well. The role of the partnership has been clarified as the provision of expert advice and support to the Liverpool City Region Climate Action Plan with this role of helping to mitigate the climate and ecological emergency and importantly to reach our zero carbon target by our target date of 2040. There are a couple of other items on there as well that the Climate Partnership is taking responsibility for, which is to oversee the establishment of a climate panel and that all important fund that I mentioned earlier. Next slide please. So the key principles are set out in detail in the report that you have. It's actually in Appendix B on tw page 28 if you would like to refer to it. There are a number of principles which I'm hoping that nobody will disagree with. They are primarily driven by this aspect of what's called climate justice. The premise that the people who are most vulnerable to the changes in our climate are those that have been least responsible for the emissions that have caused the climate crisis. It aims to put fairness, equality and inclusion at the heart of the Liverpool City region's response to climate change. So those principles are set out and I would welcome you to give us your thoughts on those. In order to articulate the action around the climate action plan that will underpin our strategy, we have proposed a series of three, uh, sorry, nine themes, which you can see on the diagram on the slide in front of you. They're the circles. 
numbered one through nine. Those themes have been proposed really just to put a kind of a framework around climate action, which is, as everybody understands, a very wide ranging and complex agenda. We've aligned them to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are targets for sustainable development that all the countries around the world have signed up to. We thought it was important that we align to the UN SDGs because it gives us a global framework for Liverpool City Region's actions. It also enables us to work with international partners as far as possible to promote some of these activities. What we have done is streamlined them slightly and merged some of them together so that they are more appropriate for the Liverpool City Region and the particular opportunities that we face. Now, one of the things that the report sets out, which is on the next slide, is the uh, time scale and work programme that we intend to bring forward. But one of the fundamental things that I wanted to agree with you is this concept that we've put forward of a year one action plan. Now, the background to that is that putting together a comprehensive climate action plan to take us up to zero carbon by 2040 is something that's not to be undertaken lightly and it's something that we want to have a lot of community participation in developing as well as the evidence base to back it up. That's going to take us some time to do but there is a recognition that we also want some very urgent action. We need to bring forward action on the climate agenda as soon as we possibly can, particularly actually in the light of the COVID pandemic, which has highlighted the need for a green recovery and the need to do things differently. So what we're proposing is to bring forward a year one action plan, which will have very short term actions that we can start on as quickly as possible. And that will come into force while we start preparing for the larger action plan, which will take some time to develop. So if we move on to the next slide, that will show our proposed work program. So first of all, the preparation of the year one action plan will start pretty much immediately and will run through to spring next year, at which time it will commence with the new financial year. We're also proposing that we'll establish our new climate panel, which will give us a, a much broader stakeholder participation range that we can use in development of the wider action plan. It's gone. It will no doubt come back in due course. Let me continue. Oh, there we are. We have a, a climate evidence baseline will start being prepared next year. And we're also intending to put forward a carbon pathways analysis, which will give the kind of research and academic background to the action plan that we're proposing. We want people to be able to engage with this plan on a number of different levels. So for those people who are able to and wish to engage with it on a very academic background to drill into the figures, we want to publish those so that people can do so. We also want people to be able to you know, read it on the bus on their way to work. You know, it needs to be that level of integration that everybody can participate as much or as little as they feel they wish to. So having done that public engagement, we then propose to publish our final zero carbon climate action plan in November 2021, which lines up with the international COP26, which is to be held in Glasgow in that month. Now, finally, I'd like to tell you about the Community Environment Fund. If we move on to the next slide, please. This is the last slide, which is just setting out the three streams that we're proposing as a community environment projects fund framework. We're proposing three streams primarily because we see that environmental action can take place at a range of levels and this is an area that we feel has an enormous pent-up demand across the Liverpool city region because there hasn't been very much funding in this agenda for a very long time. We've also seen as part of the COVID lockdown how important people's local environments are 
to the community and also in terms of their health and well-being. Those people who were unable to access green space within a close proximity to their home have really struggled during the lockdown. And this is part of our green recovery and build back better plan. So first of all, we have Stream 1 projects, which are proposed as being Liverpool City region wide projects, focusing particularly on carbon literacy, communication and engagement, bringing communities together and en enabling everybody across the Liverpool City region to access the information that they need to make changes. Because of its Liverpool City region wide framework, this is the largest range of funding. So we're anticipating bids within the 20 to 50,000 pound range to reflect the fact that it's a wide geographical influence. The second stream is more focused projects. These might be based in one local authority area. So it's slightly reduced funding range of between five and 20,000 pounds. The kind of projects we're envisaging here might be, for example, works to a local park or a cluster of schools getting together to do something very innovative around their environment or their engagement. And the final stream is stream three and these are community projects and this is our smallest funding range just a couple of hundred pounds up to 1500 pounds is our envisaged range for that and the reason for that is that this is targeted really at local community groups. So clusters of residents, potentially um, a single school, scout group, parish council who might want to do something. They just need a starting point to get them off the ground or perhaps they need some resources in terms of, um, I don't know, web hosting or help with social media just to engage the community. So those are our proposals and in summary, if you have any comments on any of these, we would be very grateful to hear from you. We'd like you to note the progress that we've made to date on the climate agenda and to give us any comments that you have either now or subsequent to this meeting on the key principles and the Community Environment Projects Fund. And I would also be very interested to hear how the overview and scrutiny committee would like to input in the creation of those two action plans, both the year one and the full action plan. And to what extent you would like us to come back and report to you on our progress. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that presentation, Rachel. Um, so you were just highlighting that you had specific recommendations. Um, <coughs> recommend, recommend to, to members of the committee, um, recommendations C, D and E in paragraph 2.1 on page 19 are asking for us to consider particular aspects of the report we've just received. Um, so as part of our deliberations, could I ask that we provide responses to these recommendations? So do bear those in mind, but obviously I'm sure uh, Rachel will be happy to answer wider questions about the, the work she's doing at the moment as well. So does anybody, we'll start with uh, Councillor Corkill. Hi, thanks Tom. Uh, thanks Rachel, that was a really good good report. Um, firstly, I just appreciate that the themes, the nine themes were um, aligned with the sustainable development goals from the UN. I think that's um, really important. And also that the, um, the LCR is taking <coughs> excuse me, is taking the idea of climate justice quite seriously. It's not always an idea that gets a lot of, um, of air time during certain meetings, but um, I think for equality, uh, it, it's absolutely crucial. My, uh, my question to you was about the Community Environment Projects Fund and um, the, the third stream, which is the community, like the lowest level. Um, it looks, uh, you may be able to correct me, it looks like the local authorities will apply for funding and then people at community level will then apply to the local authority for funding. Is that is that correct? Our what we're envisaging at the moment is that community groups can apply directly for this funding to the combined authority. So we will be delivering this funding directly to the community groups responsible. Now, 
because we have gone into this in quite a lot of detail in terms of our audit requirements and to make sure that the funding is dispersed in a, a reputable manner, we need to make sure that those community groups are existing, they have uh, an organisational structure and they have sufficient bank accounts. It couldn't be uh, dispersed to an individual, for example, even if right. they were the chair of an informal group. So it may be that though where informal groups of residents, for example, exist who wish to bid for this funding, they will need to form a linkage with an existing organisation. And that could be a local school, but it could equally be a local authority. We are aware that local authorities have very little resource that they can bring to the environmental agenda, and we wanted to spare them as much <laughs> additional work as possible. So we are intending to disperse this funding ourselves, and in answer to your question, it won't require the local authority to get involved, but of course they'd be very welcome to do so if they, if they have the capacity. OK, great. Um, my my, my um, what, what I've noticed anyway over the over the course of lockdown is um, that a lot of community groups have come together, but in incredibly informally, um, you know, street groupings or um, uh, groups across the states. And they've got a lot of stuff done, um, whether that's, you know, um, collectively uh, tidying up um, alleyways or things like that. I just wondered how it, 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 it it's going to be quite difficult for those people to get a hold of any extra cash because they're going to have to band together to form a group. Um, I, will just, I just wonder if there's any help that, can, that, that, that we could uh, kind of encourage them to carry on going with what they're doing mm. because um, it, it's been something that's really pushed them towards towards thinking more about environmental factors, but we could lose all these people that have been volunteering if, 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 if there's too much red tape. Absolutely, this is something that we have been concerned about. We, we've tried to overcome that in a number of ways. So first of all, we're aiming to make the application process really, really simple um, for the Stream 3. Make it, you know, literally one side of questions and to be delivered on our application portal, which can actually be done on a mobile phone even, to try and stop people from being excluded from that process. So that's the first thing in terms of accessibility. The second thing is that we realise that a lot of these groups are uh, quite informal. They don't have a formal governance structure or bank accounts or you know, community uh, group names even. And that's why we're encouraging them as much as possible to work with and form those linkages with other existing organisations. We've been talking to the voluntary sector organisations and the community groups that are working with them. And what we're hoping to do is to provide a forum where residents groups, for example, who are interested in bidding can be signposted towards people who can help them and take them through the process. We absolutely, this is exactly the kind of thing that we want this fund to benefit. It's a fantastic opportunity that's never been available in the Liverpool City region before. And we're, we're very keen that the momentum isn't lost on some of those excellent efforts. Excellent. Uh, no, it's a fantastic idea. Just, yeah, I really hope we, we, can, uh, we can get it done. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. OK, thanks, uh, Councillor Corkill, and thanks, Rachel. I have a few comments just on the on the three recommendations that you're asking us to look at. First of all, in recommendation C, uh, the, the, the key principles and the alignment with the sustainable development goals, I think that was re a really good move. And I think the, the range of um, different issues that are there are, are spot on. So I think that's really good. The second issue about the eligibility for the Community Environment Project Fund. I think that's really positive and obviously any money that can be made available to help community groups and uh, campaign organisations to improve awareness of and put, put together really good environmental projects is really good. But I do feel that it's not going to be enough on its own and we need to be looking at the things that only, as, as well as those things that only really are a local authority or a combined authority could could achieve. For example, 
Obviously, the issue of waste, as it stands, the waste from Merseyside is transported across the country and incinerated, re releasing all the carbon in all the stuff that we throw away back into the atmosphere. So that needs to be considered. If we're going to be zero carbon, we need to be burning next to no waste it, within by, by 2040. So obviously, whilst community projects are great and, and I'm really supportive of them, we also need to have really honest appraisal of what we only we as a as local authorities can do and just on that like referring to something that was in the report that you produced for the agenda that didn't appear in the slides you did a sectoral split mm -hmm. and there were three sectors there was transport housing and industry i believe so on that industrial emissions are reducing but obviously that's perhaps partly due to a kind of ongoing process of offshore and manufacturing from the UK. So to have a proper analysis of carbon produced by the city region, we need to include the embodied carbon in anything that comes into the region from outside, which will probably at least, if not more than, counteract that reduction in industrial activity. And I've already mentioned waste. And also within transport, does it include uh, emissions from the cruise industry, from shipping and from the airport. So I don't know if those are included within transport. So whilst recommendation D does look well thought through, I think we need to also alongside that have a much stronger emphasis on the big picture things that only uh, administrations can really sort out. And in terms of E, I think the answer is as much as possible. Thanks. Thank you very much, that's great. Uh, I have an indication from Councillor Howard that she'd like to speak. Thanks, Chair. Um, just in, in terms of recommendation E, um, I had a, a couple of questions. So you mentioned in um, your slide deck that um, part of the group that's already working towards the um, the, the first year plan um, involves input from local authority um, climate portfolio holders um, and obviously we are all members of those respective um, local authorities um, so I'm sort of questioning um, what overlap there may or may not be um, from um, uh, ourselves getting involved in um, uh, input to the um, to the action plan. Um, that said, I, I do think I agree with the chair that it's it's really important that we have some level of of scrutiny in that. Um, and it strikes me that it, it would be useful to to have some level of um, pre scrutiny. Um, so I think it has been mentioned in in previous meetings that we. Um, we tend to see um, documentation when decisions have already been made and we're asked to note them or ratify them or whatever the case may be. So it it may be useful for the, the committee or representatives from the committee to to get involved uh, at a at a pre scrutiny level before decisions have actually been made um, and input into those. Um, and, and just a, a last um, question, if I can. Um, I'm wondering how the um, the 2040 target um, sits alongside um, some of the other targets that have been set down by local authorities, specifically um, Sefton, who have committed to to net zero um, uh, by 2030. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think it would be perfectly possible with your first point to bring to you the draft version of the reports at an early stage. We're very keen, as you'll have gathered, to gain everybody's views at an earlier stage as possible. A climate emergency requires us all to act. And this isn't something that the combined authority can bring forward and expect everybody to do. We need as many voices as possible to inform this important agenda. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy to come back and uh, give you the opportunity to comment as often as you will have me. On your second point with regard to the local authority portfolio holders and the overlap, I think that 
it would be beneficial to still have the views of this committee because it gives us another viewpoint and sometimes a different perspective can be really helpful in highlighting areas that perhaps haven't been as expanded as they could be and just giving us another perspective on this very knotty issue. And finally, talking about the um, differences between the targets that the different local authorities have. A number of our local authorities have set 2030 targets. A number have set 2040 targets. Um, and of course, the national government has a 2050 legally binding target. By setting a 2040, we need to recognise in our climate action plan that some of our local authorities are taking much more rapid action with a much steeper carbon descent. And that's to be encouraged. If we can achieve zero carbon in advance of 2040, as a result of us all coordinating our action, I think that's a fantastic opportunity. So I, I'm working together with local authority officers to support each other in achieving these goals. And I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I have an indication from Councillor Watson that he'd like to speak. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Um, two points, if I may. Uh, one of the difficulties I think we're going to face is that we've uh, produced um, a, a lot of planning and activity uh, on certain criteria, one, one of which, of course, has always been much greater use of public transport. Uh, and of course, now, uh, as we've heard from uh, the mayor this morning, that's operating at 20 percent of its current level. We're, we're going to have to reassess to what extent that's going to become a permanent feature. Um, and if it is the case that it will not return to the levels we experienced in past years, what are the alternatives and how does it actually impact um, on our work in this area? And in a sense, we're in a wait and see scenario with that. Uh, hopefully, we would actually go back to a situation where public transport was the primary way by which people got around. But as we know, and we've got indications of it as we speak now, um, that how many people are going to travel to the same degree to get in to work and what are they going to do? That needs to be factored in at some stage, but we haven't really got enough information to determine what will happen. The, the second point is the question of the um, individual funding for things like community groups. Um, I think I would say that in Sefton we actually have something which is not that dissimilar in terms of principle to that. There is a, um, a budget uh, which is available ward by ward uh, where people can apply for funding um, and it's determined by the three local councillors uh, and there's also a, another fund which is again small amounts of money but it's available on a town-wide basis and um, we could, I hope, potentially help uh, with our experience of that. It's not working as well as it did because the mechanism by which it was distributed um, was ab abolished by the council itself. Uh, so the local input isn't as great as it was. But what I think I would say is that if you've already got to the stage of determining that an application form would be in the region, of one page with some questions on with the criteria that's exactly the right way to go uh, the second is to perhaps set down a criteria as to what would and would not be acceptable uh, i'll go back to the point i made before on a much more macro level um, people should uh, i think be advised that any funding available will be on a one-off basis it won't be ongoing on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. If you do that, then, you know, by definition, the money runs out and you can't help as many people as you would like. Uh, so th there is a significant potential there. Um, and uh, we, you know, in September, we have tried it. Um, it's not working as well as it used to, but that's because of internal administrative arrangements. But the principle uh, of people feeling that they can go to their local 
elected representatives and make a case for a degree of capital funding, I'll call it that. And, and that can be, to use the phrase which everybody's doing now, shovel ready. You know, we have various environmental groups who made a huge impact in things like beach cleansing. Uh, uh, some of you will, will perhaps have heard of Rock and Roll uh, in Southport. It's one of our major thoroughfares. Uh, it's been transformed. Uh, by the work of volunteers, so providing them with equipment uh, to assist them in that been a very sensible thing to do. I could give you a long list. So the principle actually has been established as far as we're concerned. Um, and I'm sure that our relevant officers would be more than happy to, ass to assist in giving their views on what's worked what hasn't worked and what could work better and you might find it appropriate to incorporate some of those lessons into the work that you're doing in this field to make sure it goes as smoothly uh, as it can and is accessible by the widest range of people notwithstanding the criteria you set which is absolutely right uh, about having a structure uh, that they can apply to such as things like bank accounts but they could also potentially put that through another organization that has a similar objective or potentially would be happy to add on to what they already do that element and you could you could then cover it uh, by taking that sort of approach but i'm sure our office would be more than happy to help uh, if you thought that would be useful that would be extra that would be exceptionally useful thank you i will contact them straight away <laughs> okay thank you rachel um Councillor Cameron. Hi, hello, Rachel. Um, just to come back to the community projects funds, um, I hope that demand will outstrip supply. I hope there is an awful lot of latent demand um, for people to apply to these funds. Um, but to come back to uh, Councillor Crone's point about impact, is there any way you can prioritise those against the actual impact they will have um, not just you know from a scientific point of view around a, a measure of carbon but more about behavioral change more about um, behavioral science in the evidence base helping you inform what will make an impact and a long-lasting impact and and some way of prioritizing uh who the funds go to what kind of projects the funds go to Yes, we do want to do that, um, particularly for the Stream 1, the larger projects. Uh, we have a range of metrics in the funding bids, particularly at that level, because the, the people who would be generally applying for that level of funding will be familiar with these terms of being asked for how many people, for example, they intend to engage with, how many people they are anticipating would go on their training course or whatever it is, um, how many schools they would engage with, for example. So that's the kind of information that we want to produce. We're very keen as well that obviously we're hoping that this will be the start of an ongoing relationship with these community groups. And what we want to do is uh, to try and learn lessons from projects that are ongoing so that we can inform others and help to grow their impact. So we will be gathering these metrics and we'll be in a position to report them back to this committee and to any others that are interested in those figures. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's great, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Rachel. And I don't think anybody else is uh, wanting to speak. So can I ask uh, if the recommendations that are set out on page 19, paragraph 2.1 of the agenda are approved, please. Are they approved? Agreed. Agreed. Fantastic. Agreed. Agreed. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. The next item is uh, item six, the work program for 2020-21. The statutory officer, Trudy Bedford, will present this report. Over to you, Trudy. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, members. The report before you today presents a draft work programme for your consideration. The work programme has been informed by the discussions that were held at the work planning session on the 29th of July. Um, if I could refer members' attention to Appendix A, and you, this, you'll see here that the work programme is broken down into a number of sections. 
The first one reflects um, reports to be presented at future committee meetings and just noting the discussions that have taken place already um, subject to your approval I will add in into that um, breakdown households into work and also liaise with Rachel around when we can bring back climate action plans so that you have an opportunity to undertake some um, pre-decision scrutiny with that regard. The work plan also reflects a number of proposed reports which are yet to have um, a scheduled meeting date. It also includes three topics for task and finish groups and then a members briefing. Just to flag up in terms of the members briefing, this is going to be very much an information session. It won't be a formal scrutiny session. So the idea is within terms of the members briefings is that you get some background to the topic and then are able to, te to determine how you wish to proceed with some, some scrutiny activity. Um, it should also be noted that the work programme is a fluid document, so it will flex during the course of the year. If there are any um, urgent issues that members wish to consider, then the, the, work, the work plan will be able to do that. So I would just advise that in terms of identifying topics for committee reports, maybe not to overburden the agenda so that that should something urgent arrive, you have the opportunity to consider that um, in, in due regard. I would therefore just draw members' attention to the recommendations set out in paragraph 2.1 and I'd welcome any comments, amendments or additional suggestions. And before, Chair, if I may indulge the committee, would it be possible to also ask members to add an additional recommendation to this report? Um, obviously, with Councillor Marshall resigning, <coughs> excuse me, Councillor Marshall resigning as a councillor, we now don't have a substitute member to the Audit and Governance Committee. So, with your indulgence, I would ask the committee to nominate a Labour councillor to act as a substitute member for Audit and Governance Committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Trudy. Shall we begin by uh, asking the Labour group to nominate a substitute member for the Audit and Governance Committee? Yes, please. So can I can I invite nominations, please, from the Labour group? Chair, can I recommend John Morgan? You certainly can. Is John Morgan's um, is, is John Morgan seconded by somebody? Seconded. So I, I didn't catch who that was. He seconded. It's Christine Howard. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Howard. So, do we need to get John Morgan to um, say that he's willing to, to carry out that role? He's not actually in attendance um, at today's meeting, so if the committee will allow us, we will um, email him and just make sure he is happy um, to be nominated as the substitute member for Audit and Governance Committee, and if he is, then we will um, proceed on that basis. Okay, is that agreed? Agreed. Good. Okay. Agreed. Thank you very much for that, everybody. Um, do people have any comments on um, on the work program that Trudy has just presented? OK, well, I'll just comment uh, just to thank you, Trudy, for your, your work on that. You put together what looks like a very full and varied agenda for us to, to take us up to the next elections. So on that note, can I ask if the recommendations as set out on page 29, paragraph 2.1 of the agenda are approved, please? Are they agreed? Agreed. agreed. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, the next item of the agenda is public engagement at the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. It can be found on page 37 to 42. The statutory scrutiny officer, Trudy Bedford, will present this report. Thank you, Chair. Members will recall at the last meeting of the committee, it was reported that Unlock Democracy had submitted two questions to the March meeting of the Combined Authority. 
the two questions related to members' attendance at the overview and scrutiny committee, and also whether an option could be introduced with regards to submitting public questions at this committee. I would draw members' attention to section 4.3 of the report and ask, you could, and ask you to consider the options and provide a response to them. This feedback and further research will then form proposals to be presented at the committee's next meeting. It should also be noted that should any changes to the governance arrangements of the committee, um, they would need to be considered and approved by the combined authority before the committee could implement them. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Do members have any comments? Okay, well, I'll just comment that as a general principle, I think encouraging as much engagement from the public as possible is really important and will always benefit democracy. Um, I understand that, you know, a bit more research is required to get it right. And it obviously needs to be done in a way that adds something positive, that adds something meaningful. Um, so I would just, you know, urge you to carry on with the work and hopefully bring some some solid proposals as soon as possible. Um, I have an indication from Councillor Pugh. Councillor Pugh? Just, just very briefly, a point I think I made last time. Um, it, I, I'm not objecting to the idea, in fact, it would encourage public participation, but we're a scrutiny committee, not an executive committee. And I suppose there's the danger that we'll be asked about the work of the executive <laughs> in our role as scrutiny. I mean, if people ask for public questions, they should be about how we scrutinize rather than how the authority is run itself, because it's, you know, otherwise we're confusing roles a little bit. Um, and they may unlock democracy, maybe slight, maybe under slight misapprehension about the work that we're doing. We can't be answerable for the local authority, for the combined authorities' uh, executive decisions. Thank you for that point. Trudy, did you want to comment on that at all? Yes, please. Thank you, Councillor Crone and Councillor Pugh. That's, that's something that I'm very mindful of, is ensuring that whatever process the committee do agree in is presented to you, that there is that distinction between the, the current arrangements that are provided for the combined authority where members can hold the combined authority to account, whereas if a public question um, session was available, so the overview and scrutiny committee, I think my initial thoughts would be that we would be asking members of the public to possibly suggest topics that require further examination, that type of thing, rather, as you say, trying to use it as a way to hold the executive to account, because other than the Metro Mayor, we wouldn't necessarily have, a, you know, a member of the combined authority in attendance to be able to then respond to that effectively. OK, thank, thank you. you for the, thank, thank you, Trudy. So are there any further comments? OK, Councillor O'Brien would like to speak. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to point out that some time ago, before I even be, became elected as a councillor, we did submit questions to the LCR about um, women and equality matters. And those questions had to be approved. So if the process is similar for overview and scrutiny, uh, Trudy would be able to say, well, you, that is not appropriate to direct the question here to a scrutiny committee. And if that's still the case, that people have to submit questions in advance, I do think it would overcome the problem so that people would know that the scrutiny committee couldn't answer their question. But then if they had an appropriate question, it could come to us, which I would welcome. Trudy, did you want to comment on that? Yes, um, thanks, Councillor O'Brien, that's correct. Um, all for the combined authority meetings, people have to submit those questions in advance and they're considered by Jill Cool in her role as the monitoring officer. And those questions need to um, reflect to ensure that they reflect the remit of the combined authority. So it, is it something that the combined authority can respond to? We have to make sure that there's, there's no um, allegations in there that could cause um, offence or have, or could cause offence. So there would be some similar process 
um, should, the, should the committee be minded for questions for overview and scrutiny committee to make sure that they were appropriate and within the remit of the committee. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I don't think anybody else has indicated that they wish to speak. So can I ask if the recommendations as set out on page 31, paragraph 2.1 of the agenda are approved, please? Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So that's the final item on the agenda. So if nothing further, I would like to thank everybody for attending the meeting. Thank you very much. And I've just had a notification come up that the next meeting of the committee will be on 4th of November 2020. So I'll see you all there, if not before. Okay, bye all. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye.